Well, I think we get started. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Bath Royal Literary and Scientific Institution and the World in 2050 series. So far, we've had three talks, and tonight will be its fourth talk out of eight. So after tonight, we'll be halfway through the World in 2050 series. So far, we've seen uh, Hamish McRae, the author of The World in 2050, give a broad over overview as to what uh, the world might be like. We then had Barrett Kupelian, the strategy director at PricewaterhouseCoopers, give a talk on the global economy. Last week, we had uh, Eunice Lowe from the University of Bristol talk to us about the climate in 2050, uh, specifically uh, focusing on heat, which is a very apt thing today. I think the temperature is about 28 out there. So uh, please bear with us. And uh, today we're going switching again, do another deep dive, and this time we're talking about society. But before I start, just to let everybody know that um, what we will be doing is a poll up front. So when I do the introductions in terms of the admin, if you want to go online, and I'm just going to move people from here so you can actually see it again. Bear with me one second. Yes, for both of you online and in the room, uh, if you want to take part in the poll, please go and get the QR code that's on the screen, or alternatively go to slider.com and put in 3575586. And I'll give you a couple of minutes because it's going to take me a couple of minutes to do the admin thing. So in all my time here, which is much longer than I care to remember at the BLSI, uh, there's never been a fire alarm in the evenings that went off. But should it go off, then I just need to tell you the evacuation procedure is relatively straightforward. Make an orderly queue, please, and walk down the stairs from whence you came. Go through the building, to the, through the front door where you came in, turn right immediately, and then go to the end of the road and turn right again and assemble at Chapel Green. And then we'll take your names and make sure that everybody has left the building. So that's really everything for the audience in the room. For those of you online, and thank you for joining us as well uh, for this sort of hybrid talk. Uh, really, the only thing to mention to you are there are three ways of asking questions later on. We're going to have some interactivity anyway with the poll. And I know Victoria has uh, something up her sleeve in terms of asking us some questions in groups about what we think about the future. So there's going to be some interactivity in the room as well as online. But there, in the Q&A session, there's three ways of asking questions. One is just to put your questions in the chat room. Secondly, to unmute your video and unmute yourself as well, and then just ask the question. I'll pick it up on the screen. And thirdly, just raise your hand electronically in Zoom. So, and that's the way I can pick you out and uh, we'll finish the evening uh, with a Q&A session and we'll draw things definitely to a conclusion by, by nine o'clock. So, without further ado, let me just let this person in. There we go. Let's go to the uh, polls. I'm sure uh, Victoria is also poised. And let's go for the first one. Oops. Okay. The first question, and please get vote now. Human behavior can have the biggest impact on transforming society. Agree or disagree? Please vote now. <laughs> it's still going. It is. I love that it started 50-50 with two people very quick off the button. Yes, but there's, there's people That's are voting. Right. People are definitely voting on the side of humans can make a difference, aren't they? Yes. And, and we'll replay this question at the end of it, see whether everybody has still got the same opinion. So this this is good. Well, let's let's draw that to a conclusion. I think this is this is pretty uh, pretty strong actually that we have a significant impact in terms of how society will turn out and it's getting more pronounced. The second question then is, is using less a meaningful way forward? Is using less a meaningful, meaningful way forward? I'm sorry about the binary questions, but they, they, they seem to be coming up with very similar results. I think there's a few more uh, no's here than we had in the, in the previous question, but it's still quite compelling. 
And then the final question, and this is an open question. What is the single most important thing humans should consider when it comes to building a new society? Just put any word in, the word that signifies that, and then we'll see all the words coming up on the screen, and uh, the most mentioned ones will be bigger than the others. Just one word? Well, as many words as you want. Okay. Nobody's. Oh, nobody's. I will do. I'll, we'll do it again at the end. So I'll give you the code again afterwards. Oh, I see. Okay. Let me just move that over a slide. There you go. Oops. So okay, this is my first slide, isn't it? Yes. So I think we'll 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 stop here now. I'm going to stop the share, and then we go on to the presentation by Victoria. But before Victoria starts, I just want to make the introductions for Victoria because I think it's a, a real real pleasure to have Victoria with us tonight. Uh, Victoria is the co-founder and director of Jigsaw Foresight uh, Consultancy. And she has been working with in international companies all around the globe to actually think about the future. And, and more importantly, think differently about the future, uh, rather than uh, just focusing on profit and, and turnover maximization. The whole point is that we need to be able to, to envision a future that actually is inclusive and actually where people are all winners rather than having the binary winners and losers scenario. So it's, it's with great, great pleasure that uh, Victoria will share some of the insights with us. But I think what is most encouraging is that actually the answer to the first two questions clearly showed that we need to be all personally involved. We're not recipients of the future. We are architects of the future. And I'm sure uh, Victoria will take us through that. Over to you, Victoria. Thank you. Um, oh, I like the clapping. Thank you. Uh, I want to just say two things before I start sharing my slides. And the first is, I'm really, really sorry that I am not there with you in person. Uh, I'm going to a wedding tomorrow in Sussex, and the logistics defeated me of getting all of that done. So I want to apologize for doing this virtually. And the second is, Andreas, I think perhaps some people's hearts will have sunk when you anticipated for them that I would be putting them into breakouts and making them work. What I want to say is, I think a nice conversation towards the end might suit you all. If you would rather sit in silence or not join a breakout group, please make that your choice. I'm not here to workshop you on a very hot Friday evening. So please make your own choices about what you will most enjoy. We are going in. Now, I need you here, Andreas, just to make sure that I am. What can you see? So far, I can, I can see your uh, slide and slide one of 47. So you need to go to duplicate uh, or presenter view. Yeah, wait a minute. Let me stop that sharing. I did something wrong there. Uh, let me share the other bit then. Okay, let's try here. How's that? All yeah. you can see is my front slide, right? That's your first slide and I can't see anything else. So that's, that's, that's good. That's what we need. Well, 47 slides will go past quite fast, I promise you. I also don't want to alarm you with the number of my slides. Um, so uh, this is a big subject, Andreas, and thank you for asking me Oops. to talk about it. What kind of futures do we want? One second. Have you put me on mute? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? No? Okay. We were all good a minute ago. Can you hear me now? We can hear you on Zoom. I can hear myself too. Andreas, can you hear me? 
The speaker is muted. That's I all. haven't muted myself. No, you you are okay. It's the other speaker. So oh, wait a minute. Yes, we can. And the yeah, people can on Zoom can hear me as well. <laughs> so everything, that's fine. Uh, I think everybody can hear you online, which is great. It's just not in the room. So we need to, okay. we need to do something here. If Ollie can uh, come upstairs, that would be much appreciated. Is your microphone on, uh, Victoria? I, well, people on Zoom can hear me, so I'm imagining you can hear me, right? So strange. So, Judy, thank you. You can still hear me, right, Judy? Andreas, can you hear me? Oh, I can't hear Andreas. Okay, we thanks. Can't hear you, which is a bit shame. You can. Everybody can hear you online. Yeah. I see, wonder where Ollie is. If you bear with me, I'm just Ollie. We've, we seem to have lost uh, Victoria. She can be heard online. Is it just the wire that's come loose, maybe? Nothing else has happened. Let me. If we stop sharing. Yep. And try this whole thing again. Okay. Can you can people hear me? Yeah, it's in really the room now. Uh, Victoria, why don't you leave and come back in again, and then and then we'll try that. Okay. Is she using Zoom? She is using Zoom, yes. Well, it's Victoria. <laughs> Does that work? Can you Have we solved the problem, Andreas? I think so. Now, do I dare to share again? Because it seems to be when I share that the moment you've disabled screen sharing. Yeah, let me just, can you just uh, let her be co-host over there, Oli? So I think we can hear you loud and clear now, which is nice. Great. Now let's see whether I ruin it all by sharing my screen. Ollie is just going to make you co-host, which is now, so you can now share your screen and we should be all good. Can you still, can you still hear me? Yes. Hooray! Well, there you go. This is what virtual meetings are all around, all about. So, um, society in 2050 is a huge subject. And the theme that I've taken here is what kind of futures do we want? And also in the context of that, what kind of ancestors would we like to be? So uh, Andreas has introduced me in one way. I thought you might need to know a little bit more about me to make sense of some of the things I might say. I was born in Kiribati, uh, which makes climate change particularly acute for me because it's one of the first island states that will disappear. I went to Cambridge, I did languages and art, so I come at things with a rather humanist point of view, offset perhaps slightly by a little bit of a career in finance. And then since 1997, I've been researching and consulting in and around things like work, workforce, workplace, communities, how organizations work, how change works, and also a little bit about ceremony and endings and bereavement. I'm an amateur musician, I'm a grandmother, and I now live near Cambridge. So that's a little bit about me to help tune you in. 
And I want to start by wondering, when you're thinking about 2050, which is in 27 years' time at the moment, where do you start? Um, and there's a, a, a futurist called Paul Sappho, who people quote very often in the world that, world that I work in. And they say, he says, look back twice as far as you look forward. So before we end up in 2050, we're going to go back a little way, starting from today. What's going on today? Well, we know there's a new king, there's a war in Ukraine, the US electioneering is starting up. There is more and more concern in all kinds of ways about uh, immigration and refugees and global heating is reaching a point of no return. In fact, um, there's so much about it in the press that uh, as there is about generative AI, that it's almost hard to cut through and see the bigger, longer picture. We're hearing things about lab grown meat, renewable energy, self-driving cars. Um, hybrid working is pretty much here to stay, as this evening uh, indicates. Gender politics are increasingly for. And Elton John, Sir Elton John, old people can still do good concerts, which is a great relief to me. It gives me another future. So let's go back. What was happening in 1996? I picked a few things here. Um, the UN Comprehensive Nuclear Test Treat uh, Ban Treaty, uh, Chechen War ending, quite a lot of stuff um, around technology here. The first flip mobile phone, Java, Hotmail, Nintendo, DVDs, Concorde's last passenger flight. I would have put that later, remembering it. Uh, outbreaks of, uh, of, of uh, disease, BSE, Dolly the Sheep, genetically modified food, the first genetically modified tomatoes. Uh, sold in supermarkets. Bill Clinton. As we think about AI, I think it's kind of interesting to note that it was 27 years ago that Deep Blue, the computer, defeated Gary Kasparov. I remember Wannabe and Harry Potter because my daughter was around eight and seven or eight at the time. So um, they stick in my mind, those dances that the Spice Girls did. I'm sure those of you with children the same age will remember that too. And queuing for the Harry Potter books, perhaps you remember that. So that was 27. What about if we go back another 27 years? We're in 1969. And there's a different flavor to this. Concorde, in fact, is doing its first flight. Boeing is doing its first flight on the 747s. The Victoria Line opens. I didn't choose that because it's called after me, or I'm called after it, perhaps, or which way around. Um, a different president, the first Big Mac, and I love the picture here of the Big Mac with that groovy kind of 1960s typeface. The first Earth Day, I've snuck that in, although it was the year afterwards, because I think that's very relevant to the things that we're thinking about. Experiments with bodies, uh, with the first temporary artificial heart. The Beatles' last performance, which you've got a picture of here um, on a rooftop. Um, Various things changing with the news. Prince Charles becoming, Charles becoming the Prince of Wales. A lot of things I, are, are quite strong in my memory from that time. And yours, I'm sure. I remember watching Apollo 11. And I think in 1969, we would have imagined in 2023, very different kind of space futures, uh, perhaps further advanced than the ones we're experiencing now. So when we travel forward to 2050, we're actually thinking in kind of 80 odd years and thinking about the societies of the past and what we liked and didn't like about them or the big changes in them can help us really think about our preferred futures and societies. Thinking about how we used to eat, use energy and get around and how, what that might mean for how we will do that. How will we in 2050 play, work, live, love, grieve, worship. There are today already churches of AI, people worshipping the AI. What will happen to the way we worship in future? What kinds of values and beliefs will we want? The word cloud was very interesting in prioritising social justice. I thought that was very encouraging. So going back into, the, into history is extremely important in helping us think about just and sustainable transitions. And I think also wondering who our guiding elders will be. In 2050, who will we look back on um, and say that they have guided us? 
And I want to go via Elise Balding uh, as an elder for this long thinking, if you like. Uh, she was very influential in the Long Now Foundation, Stuart Brand's foundation. And she had this lovely idea that, that we all have a 200 year present. Uh, we can reach out our hands quite easily and touch a hundred years either side of us. So if you think about that, you have a very long timeline that you're carrying around with you all the time. And I thought just to illustrate that, I would bring another little bit of autobiography in and show you my parents who are in there. Well, my mother's nearly 90, my father's nearly 92 with their youngest great grandchild. So you're actually looking pretty much at 200 years with me sandwiched somewhere in the middle there, either side of me. And, and, and all of us, if we think in those longer timelines, uh, might think differently about what it means to have good ancestors and be good ancestors. When I was reading Hamish McRae's book, there was one sentence that really jumped out at me. Well, two sentences. Climate change is at the very centre of current concerns. I should say in that respect that my father has been a very early adopter of electric cars. So good on him. He's being a good ancestor. He also says, Hamish McRae, that climate change is a huge, hulking, holistic, interconnected and existential problem, which Andreas um, touched on at the beginning. Uh, when we talked about this in our team, when I was preparing this talk, we thought that was slightly wrongly framed, actually. We thought that it was more a symptom, perhaps, of our thirst for certain kinds of consumer society, our thirst for a particular kind of modernity. So perhaps the challenge that Andreas raised at the beginning is uh, related to the fact that it's a symptom of our desires, and how do we need to change our desires and actions in order to collectively not just move to societies we want, but look at the bigger problems that those societies might solve together. And that's what brings me to deep transitions. Now, I am not a deep transitions theorist. Uh, deep transitions is a history-based way of looking at change. The Deep Transitions Futures Project is a year-long panel that ran from the middle of 2021 to the middle of 2022. It's a panel of, it was a fantastic panel of uh, influential international investors, all interested in looking at what kinds of sustainable transitions uh, financiers could be more transformative around. And that research, which, uh, my colleague Wendy and I helped with the facilitation of the panel for is the basis of the futures, the storylines I'm going to talk to you about today. Now, this is where you're going to get me skimming over the theory. What you really need is Johann Schott, uh, and I urge you to go and hear him speak on YouTube and read the investment philosophy. A deep transition. What is a deep transition? It's a series of interconnected changes that transform society in a fundamental way. Now, the three systems that you can transform interdependently, if you like, or in multiple ways that connect with each other, that we as humans can make a huge difference around, are the systems of food, energy and mobility. So what I'm going to start talking about is how those systems interconnect a bit. And a deep, deep transition, tiny little bit of the theory here, these are systems that provide certain societal needs, so energy, food, and mobility. They're systems that are made up of different things. There are rules that run those systems, people who act in them. You only have to think of people like Elon Musk to imagine an actor in, uh, in energy and transport. And they have different elements, so science and technology, culture, consumer behavior, policy, and industry. The rules are things that we assume are how things work around here. And they might be really explicit rules like regulations, or they might be implicit rules. This is the way we do things around here. You may not always in passing notice when a rule is changing. Um, you may only notice after it has changed. I was in France uh, a couple of days ago talking of rules. This is a slight detour, but I think relevant. And I got out of the Eurostar in Paris and immediately smelt cigarette smoke. 
And I thought, oh, but, you know, 20, 30 years ago, I wouldn't have noticed it. I wouldn't have noticed the absence. I only notice it because of the absence of smoking in general, uh, or at least smoking cigarettes. Um, when you're thinking about a system, you're also thinking about the stable rules that are dominant in that regime and the stable actors. And what breaks that regime apart is different niches. So the thing you're thinking about when you're thinking about a deep transition is little bubbling up pockets of change that you might be able to coordinate to make a bigger, bigger breakthrough change in a direction that you would like to go. Um, all the while thinking about social justice. That is the ideal of deep transitions. There's more to it than that. And this theory is based actually on the first deep transition. So having gone back to 1969, I'm now taking you further back, I think to 1760 or so, to the Industrial Revolution, which ran for about 80 years. And that transition absolutely fundamentally reinvented everything we know really about society, about energy, about food, about cities, about how cities work. Um, it, uh, it created unprecedented economic growth, prosperity and innovation, and also there were obviously side effects around poverty. Um, it did really provide for our basic needs in energy, mobility and food, uh, all of which were linked systems. But it also entrenched in us uh, systems that no longer serve our purpose around resource exploitation, use of fossil fuels, biodiversity loss, which we're talking about a great deal now, social inequality. So the first deep transition is, if you like, no longer fit for purpose. And what the Deep Transition Futures Project is looking at is what might a second deep transition look and feel like. A second deep transition will emerge when we really sort out what we want the futures of these different systems to be. How do we really want food, energy, transport, health and other things to be? How can we interconnect them uh, in ways that will serve us to have healthier futures. And in a way, the level of crisis that we're all facing and talking about helps us because it means as a society, it seems we're very ready to act, um, however hard that may be. I just want to make one tiny more theoretical point before we get onto the storytelling bits, which is when you're thinking about change, there are, there's a real danger that you can um, end up just optimizing your system uh, because you make the most of what you've got. We go on using fossil fuels. We go on using privately owned cars. We go on doing things and just making them more efficient. You can break through from that a bit uh, with partial systems redesign, but for a systems change, you've got to actually do th things very differently. So I mentioned Elon Musk, uh, and I'm sure he won't be the only time he comes up in one of these talks. Tesla cars, obviously, are, uh, oh, what have I done there? Ah, oh, there we go. Let me move that back to being a slideshow. Uh, Tesla cars uh, are a new way of getting around. Uh, they're very good in some ways for the environment. In other ways, they're less good for the environment. Uh, they are starting to build an infrastructure. So you might say that system is being partially redesigned. But actually, for it really to work for a, uh, for a different kind of transport, uh, we might have to think of different kinds of car sharing, different kinds of charging system, different kinds of infrastructure to mean that we're absolutely breaking through. Victoria, your, yes. slide, your slide thing is still loading. It hasn't actually loaded yet. That's interesting. So the picture has only just loaded. So, so you've unshared the screen, so maybe you want to reshare? Yeah, let me just find the right one to share. Wait a minute. Let me go here. Exit full screen. Sorry about that. I pressed a funny button. Let me do that. Let me go there. Let me. So currently you're unshared. You're not sharing the screen. I know. I'm about to come back and see whether we can make that work again. How's that? Yes, you're back. Okay. So you might, if you really wanted a breakthrough with something like uh, transport, 
think of cars as mobility as a service rather than ownership models, that kind of thing. So we're going to look a little bit now uh, at imagining futures by uh, learning from the past uh, and also imagining futures and then working back from them uh, to imagine how we might get there. Let me. The panel process actually had three parts, uh, a little bit of time spent on theory and then a lot of time spent on world building, which is where I'm going to go now. And then we ended up with a philosophy and some principles to guide investment, which I will spend less time on today. And that middle bit of building storylines around the future based on scanning and research and some imagination and a lot of collaboration was incredibly important for building, if you like, a, a world building mindset. And we created ultimately three future worlds that I'm going to talk to you about a little bit now to help spark our imaginations. The first of those, uh, do no harm, uh, very much a values-based world. Um, how do we work first to make sure that we look after the planet that we're in? So it's a shift in values to prioritizing that. Earthshot, in brief, is we can innovate our way out of this problem. And after the frugal turn, which some people might think is a little close to first do no harm, but after the frugal turn is about becoming very, very a circular economy, recycling uh, waste, very careful about waste, extre extremely scrupulous in um, the resources we draw on and making sure that we're very careful about stewarding them. So it has a different flavor to first do no harm. If we go a little bit into those worlds and imagine our futures in those worlds, let's take first do no harm. So at the heart of this idea of a future and future societies is the idea of ecological regeneration and restoration. So what if we, this is a wake up call, 2023, let's say, is a wake up call, and we decide we want to care for the planet and for the ecosystems? How does that work out if we are, see ourselves as any part of a kind of spectacular, indivisible web of life. How do we live then? Do we stop using so much electricity? Do we turn the street lights off at night? Uh, do we only consume what we can make with very small number of, uh, you know, locally or with ingredients that are not doing damage to the earth? Do we decide that we won't travel? Do we decide that we won't travel even if that means sacrificing seeing our families? Uh, do we decide to find other ways to be close to people and intimate with our families and care for people, other ways to adventure? So how far do we take our commitment to the planet if we take first do no harm as the future we would like to inhabit in 2050 and strive for that? Now, a couple of uh, things that might happen. One thing that we spoke about in the research team was if you're thinking in that kind of a way, um, one of the things we might really be nostalgic for is the smell of, uh, I don't know, chip fat uh, or peanut butter, the taste of peanut butter or the taste of cod or chocolate or coffee. So uh, one of the ideas we came up with, which already exists as an art project, is what if the street truck that's coming around on a Friday evening is not the very excellent bigger pizza um, street van that comes around to us on a Friday evening in my village, but it's the ghost food van. And you can come and you can have sensory experiences that take you back to your youth, as well as maybe uh, something else to eat. So uh, we really noticed that in this future, we might be nostalgic for things that we really enjoyed, but that if we live by first do no harm, we have to sacrifice and are there other ways of gaining access to that sensory experience? The other thing, again, actually interestingly about touch is we spent quite a lot of time thinking about how will I stay connected with my family, uh, the other side of the world? Uh, how do I stay in touch with them? How do I feel as though I'm touching them? Um, uh, how do I commit to that localness uh, and not to my own travel priorities because my grandchildren are somewhere else? So there was quite a lot of loss in this um, 
in this world, but also in pursuit of a better, um, a better relationship between people and planet. Earthshot is a clever future. Uh, Earthshot is the one that leans on the promise of grand solutions, um, rather like the Apollo 11 mission. So uh, there were missions to put humans on the moon that have come up earlier. Uh, and new movements to get into space, which are happening at the moment. What if we can innovate our way and deliver on the promise of solving these big challenges through our fantastic ingenuity and entrepreneurial spirit? What does that world look and feel like? Do we put our data centers on satellites to stop them being so extractive on Earth? Do we eat insects uh, and mushrooms and uh, lab meat um, which is already a thing, as you saw in the timeline earlier. Do we have um, car sharing arrangements uh, rather than personal ownership of cars? How far do we go in the technological innovations and in making those attractive to people, which is a bit different to the um, first do no harm thing, which is a values led one rather than an innovation led future. So we had some fun with that. Um, and we also thought the kids are going to want to be bad in any kind of future. So we imagined that if we did end up with Skypod, say, brilliant new cars invented by firms like Mitsubishi and Tesla that fly or can drive or can perhaps, you know, do all kinds of things. They're connected in pods. Uh, what about if instead of parkour all over the South Bank or wherever in Bath the parkour takes place? There are kids doing podcur, jumping in and out and over and between the pod vehicles, and parents are demanding action to stop them doing that. So there are always going to be bad kids or people who want to push the boundaries. So we wondered about how unexpected play or disruption or the other side of things might come out in this very technologically advanced future. And then finally, of the three futures that we're going to play with today or that we were playing with in the panel, after the frugal turn. And this assumes that in a, in, in a future world, we really pay attention to sufficiency. Instead of breaching the natural limits of the planet, uh, we face up to the consequences of consumption and turn instead of limitless consumption to being in favor of living within the Earth's capacity for sustaining life. That might mean that in our homes, we commit to generating the, or villages or communities, we commit to generating the electricity we use. It might mean that we commit to growing our own food. It might mean that we uh, take great care in any kind of travel. Uh, there are consequences as well to this future if we're going to be really, really scrupulous about um, only using electricity that we can generate, we may also decide to end night illumination, which is already happening. Women may feel a great deal less safe and may ask for the bringing back of lights to make them feel safer. There are other things that we played with in this future. If we are being much more careful about how we use electric light, in order to conserve energy? Uh, do our eyes get more used to looking at the dark or seeing in the dark? Um, what does that mean for opticians? Do we, opticians start to, do we start to buy night spectacles so that we can see more easily in the dark and live our lives, live our lives uh, uh, with long evenings as we currently expect to do now? Uh, so, those were some of the futures that we played with. And then we used those futures to imagine what kind of investing in niches across food, mobility and transport might lead us towards those futures, all of which are desirable in different ways. And some, more dis some people are drawn more to Earthshot, some more to do no harm, some perhaps to the frugal turn. But of course, we don't know what is going to happen in the future. It might be a mixture of those things or something else. The question that Andreas pointed out was, how do we choose to make our actions in society and in corporates such that we are moving towards desirable futures and possibilities? 
Now, another favorite thing that futurists say is the future is already here. It's just not very evenly distributed. So some of the things I noticed in preparing this talk is, for example, Pedro Couture, the nettle dress is a documentary that's just come out about a man who spent seven years making a dress from foraging for nettles and other materials. He did it as an art project. He did it to be slow, but he also did it to recover from a bereavement. So also by engaging with, after the frugal turn might be a much slower society and there are already slow movements. But that slowness may also allow us to make room for more complex emotions, for grief and bereavement. I thought that was a nice example of something happening already, even if as an art project. Um, again, this could be a couple of futures. This could be a uh, after the frugal turn in one way, but also an Earthshot future, which is that uh, a member of the Clocks family is becoming extremely high tech in creating circular barefoot wear using Tesla technology to reimagine footwear that is designed one set of shoes at a time in the most high tech way and using virtual uh, reality and so on to create exactly the right shoes for people individually. So that is something that's happening already, which shows these aspects of some of these futures um, exist already. Uh, in Hampton Court this year, uh, prairie plant planting, uh, a prairie planting garden one, and apparently, I can't say it, prairie planting for your garden is really taking off in the UK. Prairie planting is uh, planting for climate change, planting for more desert conditions, less rain. So, again, that's bringing the future nearer. Those kinds of innovative ideas about how we might want to live and garden and play and uh, have our recreation. And then this really came into my inbox only yesterday. It was in The Guardian, I think, yesterday. But one of the very biggest, um, when you think about beer, um, it costs a lot to the environment to make beer. And there are experiments going on, interestingly, between a brewer in Brooklyn and uh, beer manufacturers in Africa to uh, use phonio, which is a native African grain, which uses much, 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 much less water uh, than hops and the other things that you make beer with. Uh, and apparently it's a fantastic beer. So that is already being prototyped and thinking about how our leisure, uh, I guess you could say that's a do no harm, uh, would come under the do no harm uh, future mainly. But these things are already going on all around us. And I found by being very aware of these futures, I'm spotting change very quickly early on and spotting how it doesn't, how it can be really quite sophisticated change. This is sophisticated beer. It's also interestingly, without going off down a sort of detour, uh, quite interesting because it's challenging uh, in a sense, uh, colonial assumptions in Africa about what kind of grain was acceptable for beer. Uh, and as uh, I can share the article afterwards, if anyone is interested, it really got me thinking. So having taken you on a very quick uh, tour around some of the work we did to imagine future worlds before we imagined investors as world builders, I wanted to throw it open to you actually, and invite you to think about what does it mean to be a good ancestor in these and in other stories? If the actions we take now are critical to 2050 and beyond, what kinds of actions might we want to take in the way we socialize, in the way we play, work, live, love, what else? How might we want to create and consume things differently? What kinds of values might we want to uphold? And then what are some of the things that will be missing for better or for worse? Will we miss as with the ghost food truck? Will there be things we miss and we yearn for? 
are there things that will no longer be there that we'll be pleased about? And as I said earlier on, who are the elders in those futures? Are we the elders setting direction? Who are the elders we can see around us from any sphere of arts, scientists, uh, business, academia? And there are some other things we could think about, about how we respond or adapt to shocks, um, how we're just. So there are some questions futurists use when they're talking about these kinds of things, about so how do we define those kinds of our values? How do we relate to each other and to the values? How do we connect with each other? How do we create and consume? And what do we destroy uh, as we make change? Um, and what I thought it might be nice to do now, unless you have particular questions, is to hold these futures lightly in mind. They're not the only ones you can imagine, but they're quite useful as a kind of vessel for exercising the imagination. So, uh, Andres, I suppose at this point I could invite people perhaps to ask any questions or we could go into breakouts, but my idea was that we... Might people in the Zoomies or Zoomsters, as you call them, Andreas, that the Zoomsters might, uh, the Roomsters might turn to each other and just have a conversation about what kinds of things can we do to be good ancestors or how might we want to be in those futures or what would challenge us about them. And the Zoomsters I could put into breakouts to do the same thing. But I'll stop sharing now. I've got a couple more slides for the end and see whether you would rather do that, Andreas or whether you would rather take some questions. No, I, th I think this is a good idea. I think what we've heard so far is a very different take on the society. It's not something that, uh, that we receive, it's something that we construct. And I think uh, taking that idea forward, if, if you would like to discuss just two of you or next to your neighbor next to you, spend literally two or three minutes discussing one of these worlds and uh, see what you think 2050 might be like. So the three worlds, I know you're not sharing them. One was do no harm. So this is um, going back to basics and actually looking after the planet. That's one world to discuss. The other one was the uh, was it, uh, earth shot. And that is much more of a technological one where technology will sort all our problems out. You know, uh, Mr. Musk will become president of the earth and he will sort it out for <laughs> So that's, that's another world you can discuss. And the third world is after the frugal turn, which is much more of a self-sufficient society. So pick any one of those. So, you know, it's, uh, it's up to you. And spend two or three minutes uh, with the neighbor next to you discussing that world and what that might mean. And yeah, give you three or four minutes and then we'll regroup. And I will do the same for people online, Andreas. I'll just give them three or three, four minutes in a breakout in twos and threes. If you don't want to join a breakout, feel free to just stay here. There you go. I'm unmuted now. So we've got a gentleman in the room who wants to share their thoughts about their world. Brilliant. 50. Yeah, we had a little group, um, obviously slightly different generations. So we, we found it hard to find one of the three worlds. But I launched in, I think, as an engineer um, in my 50s. Uh, technology is my, my world. So I think... Yes, technology in the middle world, Earth, Earth shot, is what I most re relate to. However, yep. um, my wife was more in the vein of the frugal world, that we should do that. It's possibly the hardest one, but we will possibly have to. Uh, and colleagues to my left were also in the first one. So, yeah, we all had all three were on the table. Interesting. And probably thought that yeah, all elements of one of them, or elements of all three, will be uh, how we get to where we get to in the future. Was there anything in particular that appeals to you about what you might do uh, as a first step in an Earthshot world? I don't know your name, I'm afraid. Sorry, Toby. 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 Yeah, we did, uh, you didn't get that far. We, we didn't quite get that far. We did also did talk about elders. Thank you for a reminder. <laughs> but uh, trust in elders and actually uh, we feel that moving society is moving back to the more local level. Uh, trusting, we well, hope so, yeah, moving towards trusting more people locally less trust in our elders, brackets, central government, and actually more action happening locally seems to be a good trend. Oh, that's very interesting. Of course, elders, political elders, I, I really understand why you say that, but 
you know, we did all trust in Elton John to close, uh, close Glastonbury. So there are different kinds of elders, aren't there, that we might look to uh, for inspiration. But the question is where the future elders are. So who are the people in their 50s? Actually, lives will be much longer. So we might still be around, Toby, to be elders yeah. uh, in that uh, future and for quite a while afterwards, given the way um, lives are lengthening out in some parts of the world. And I think also what's interesting, uh, Victoria, is that uh, Toby and the team have sort of discussed it's very difficult to stay in one world. Yeah. You know, it's actually, you know, these are three interconnected worlds where it is about emphasis at different times, different it places. Is. So it is. is it there is anybody a... else in the room who wants to say something in another group? Otherwise, we go to the honor. Oh, there's a gentleman here. Yes. If you speak directly into Hi, um, so I'm Trevor. Uh, was it Barry? Barry, Barry, Erica. So we had a little chat, but uh, I, I think I might have dominated this a bit. The point I made was a couple of things that I think are quite key. One is that you don't mention the distinction between what people want and what people need, which would be in all, you know, any previous culture, they would have be very clear about whether you want something or not is hard, neither here nor there. It's not necessarily what you need. And that see, we live in a consumer society that seems to have disappeared. Uh, another point was um, Alexander King was interviewed in 1972. Uh, he was one of the founders of the Club of Rome. Mm -hmm. And when he was asked what he thought was the most obstructive, the most obstructive elements to change, he said the two things he was most concerned about were the political electoral cycle being so short term and the extraordinary obtuseness of government bureaucracies. And again, uh, that didn't really come up uh, so far. You're absolutely right. I rather ducked the whole question of politics, didn't I? And the cycle of uh, the political cycle. But you make very, very strong cases. And I guess if we were to spend more time on these worlds and apply the theory to them, you would take a deep look at what would you be doing as a government or in governance terms to support, uh, put in place the incentives for a frugal world or an earthshot world or a do no harm world. And I'm afraid I did skate over that a bit because my subject was society and I rather took that to be people, but perhaps it was because I was avoiding as well. But if don't, you go- don't. Don't yeah. worry, Victoria. Next week's talk is all about uh, global society in terms of governance and politics. So uh, this is a great segue. Uh, Victoria, do you have anybody in the breakout rooms that wants to say I something? I don't know. Does anyone who was in the breakout rooms want to say something? They can, of course, unmute themselves. Yeah, and say please something. unmute yourself or put your hand up. Or I'm afraid it was a bit short, wasn't it? But at least a chance just to connect with people you've been on Zoom with. Anyone from the breakout rooms? Imogen, I think you're here, aren't you? Imogen Wade. Sorry to name you. I think you are. This is unusual, but the online audience is, is, is shy and the okay, in the room are. audience are quite... Peter, Peter, is there anything you'd like to say? Um, well, apart from the fact we were rather cut off short. Yeah, sorry. And uh, there are only two of us in the room. So... Um, I think it was what we found difficult was the fact that there were just these three sort of visions, um, and the, the just the, the practicality of doing anything, which is basically where we are in the world at the moment. We know we've missed all our climate targets pretty well so far, and uh, we'll carry on doing so into the future, as far as one can see. So uh, it's then you know, people saying, uh, what on earth are we going to uh, do to ameliorate these things? I mean, emotionally, I think we turn to do no harm and the frugal mm -hmm. practicalities of having a world like that and the politics of it um, would leave me totally baffled. And I would have thought any of your investors, but uh, that's about where we got when we were cut off. That's very helpful, Peter. And perhaps I should explain that we, in fact, 
we're using these worlds as devices to think about as investors if we really wanted to create worlds rather than just invest in returns for immediate shareholders, what kind of worlds would we like to hold in mind as preferred futures? So if I give an example, for example, of where that led us in thinking about possibilities for investing in a frugal world, it might be that you would invest in local e-bikes with an infrastructure that would allow those to plug into uh, data systems that would allow you to see when those bikes might need repair. You might, as a side effect to that, also help create local repair skills and local technical skills, which would help you keep those bikes going for longer. So it is a mixture, as you say, of borrowing things, as, as Toby said, actually, borrowing things from ideas from Earthshot, but to make the frugal world work. And as an investor, that you can then think, well, could we push possibilities keep open possibilities for all these worlds in the way we invest in things like transport, energy and food systems and see those as connected investments rather than things we're making independent decisions about. I guess transition towns would also say that they've made some efforts in both frugality and do no harm uh, in the way that local towns are managing themselves. So I think it might be hard in the abstract to think, what might I do? Um, but as a collective of people in a town or a city or a village, getting together and using these imaginary worlds and think, well, what could we do to move towards them might lead to some collective action. But I'm sorry it was short. I was slightly following Andreas's then thing of two or three minutes and he was off in one of the rooms and I didn't want us to overrun. So I do apologize for cutting short your conversation. Don't worry, Victoria, there's going to be so much time over the series. We've got another four weeks of this series. There's going to be plenty of discussions and, and uh, conversations to be had. So I think it's been really interesting. I think one of the things that uh, stands out for me is that uh, sometimes we can get overawed by the challenge ahead. You know, we talk about climate change and none of the climate uh, uh, commitments having been fulfilled. Uh, but then, you know, if we do that, then it becomes quite nihilistic quite quickly. And I think we should be focusing on what we can do individually. And I think you mentioned generate your own electricity, change your diet, drive electric cars, potentially. There's, there's, there's heaps of stuff we probably can do at a local level. Now, do you want to go back to your presentation, Victoria, and uh, finish off? We just need to share I, the screen. I will just, uh, I just had a couple of final things to say, although I'm very happy to share things with you afterwards, if you would like. Uh, so. There we are. I, I'm, I didn't go through them in detail, but just so that you can see, these are the investment principles that we ended up with after that world building process and then applying it using deep transitions theory to how might investors shift their behavior. I think these are written rather in an investory way uh, and perhaps not entirely helpful to individuals, but there are a couple of things that come right back to the original world cloud, which are including and giving voice, to people who might not always have had voice in other systems. Doing what we did in that process, which is visualize desirable futures, three of which we've talked about, uh, and then imagining how you might direct your activity towards those futures and therefore create a bit more hope, I think. Um, very importantly, thinking about um, being a world builder and doing that collectively. I'm just picking that out of the investment. And we also have resources to invest, right? So when we're thinking about invest, investment processes, I have time, I have relationships, I have money and a house, I have family. So actually, in, if you get away from a, just a money idea about investing, I think we could see ourselves as investors of our resources in a transformative process. And then I think um, sharing, learnings, uh, some somebody interestingly in a workshop I was running about something else earlier this week was talking about how she shares her experiences of having an electric car with others on social media. And in fact, we do all share our experiences about those things. And that side to side sharing of experiences might be one of the better uses of social media to help and encourage and nudge each other towards the kinds of futures that we would like. 
uh, rather than the more dystopic uh, uses that social media can be put to. Um, the link is at the end. But before we go, I just wanted to say something to you about ice and about cocktails. I've mentioned beer. And we've all mentioned that the summers are getting hotter. In fact, the Met Office said only a couple of weeks ago that by 2070, London summers will be as hot as Nice if carbon emissions keep rising. So I wanted to ask you to think on your way out to have your Friday evening drink about ways in which we could change our cocktail behaviour. When I was looking at this, there's a marvellous article I can give you a link to of this about ice. I can't remember his name. He's, uh, I had to, would have to look at my slide notes. Hang on a sec. I'm just going to go over and look. Frederick Tudor. He was an entrepreneurial Bostonian. And he got the idea of, in the early 19th century, cutting blocks of ice from his Massachusetts lake to sell it to places where temperatures were too warm for ice to form naturally. Um, not only that, he went to Cuba in 1815, which, let's remember, is about halfway through the Industrial Revolution. So we're back in the 1760 to 1840 timeline from our earlier timelines and got the Cubans to start putting ice in their drinks. And thus it was that ice became absolutely essential for cocktails. But ice is really bad for the environment. It's very expensive to make in environmental terms. So one thing I thought uh, you might want to think about that um, mixologists are thinking about is how do we become more sustainable uh, with ice? Because none of us wants to drink hot cocktails. Although interestingly, ice is bigger in America than it is here or was. Uh, anyway, so one thing I thought you might want to think about is to ask your next bartender what their sustainable transition ice strategy is. The other thing is that there is a big movement. Uh, what, will your, what will your cocktails in 2050 be if they're do no harm cocktails or frugal cocktails or earth shock cocktails? Uh, and there are some great bartenders, particularly on the West Coast of the US, playing with just these sorts of ideas. So they're playing with uh, dehydration, which I think we could call earth shot. Uh, they're playing with using different kinds of serums and technologies to boil things down to an essence. They're playing with fermenting and banana wine, which is quite light on the environment and uses old banana skins, which is a frugal turn one, I would say. Uh, they're playing with tapache, which is Mexican fermented soda with sugar, water, cinnamon and pineapple, growing their own ingredients, using the leftovers from the restaurant that they're associated with to make earthier, more Bloody Mary type cocktails. Uh, obviously changing the straws, which we could call an earth shot kind of a mixology. Um, and thinking about infusions, using old bits of wine in different ways. So I just thought that you might want to think as you head out for you into the cocktail hour um, about the kinds of ways you might change your um, ice and cocktail habits as a first step towards one of these worlds. And that was how I thought I might. Oh, I guess also to notice those little things are great clues to the future. Just get you thinking and go, well, should I change from um, an ordinary beer to a beer made with the uh, with the grain that we spoke about earlier. Should I slightly change my habits uh, and um, still enjoy myself with my cocktails, but know that I'm thinking about the consequences of my choices? So that was my invitation to you on a very hot Friday evening. And I think that is everything I would like to say for now, Andreas, unless there's anything else you have that, for me. Thank you very much indeed. Please put your hands together for Victoria. Now, as you, as you can all uh, tell, this was uh, a very different uh, lecture to the previous of global uh, lectures around statistics and information. This was much more geared uh, towards us as individuals who are architects of the society rather than merely recipients. And what we can do individually, collectively, uh, to, to create the world in 2050, despite all the global trends, despite Earthshot and the technology, despite actually having to be more frugal and more self-sufficient and, and probably have a different attitude uh, to, to the planet. Now, there's been there's quite, a, quite a few questions and comments online. But we're going to throw it open. We've got about 20 minutes or so for Q&A. 
So I'll throw it open in the room first before we go online. But also, if you're online, please unmute and show your video and you can ask questions of Victoria directly from the screen. I'll start in the room. Who would like to go first with a question? Toby again. <laughs> Hello, Toby here again. Um, as part of the work and the futures, did you come across universal basic income as a yes. sort of concept? And is it increasing? And is it uh, seen as a positive thing to get us to 2050 society we would like? We didn't really talk about universal basic income for the reason that we were concentrating on these three technical terms, socio-technological systems of food mobility and transport, where if investors change their investment practices, they stand a chance of being seriously influential in sustainability transitions. So it wasn't really in the forefront of the conversations we had. Uh, and I'm not really qualified to say something about it, but there have been, in fact, just yesterday, some 2050 scenarios dropped, uh, published by the EU, which talk a great deal about the mechanisms of governance um, uh, and behavioural nudges and so on. I can dig out the link to it, if you like, Andreas, but talk about the political imperative to make life possible for as many people as possible at the right level of income. And obviously there's a related question there about, I haven't really talked about, I've managed to get away almost completely without talking about chat GPT and AI. So there are related questions in any of these worlds about what technology would do to any of these worlds that I have sidestepped as well. And that would lead you to wonder about work and not working as a separate subject. And Jude, can I just pick up, Andreas, that Judy also says in the chat, this feels like quite an elitist discussion. If you're struggling to make ends meet living on benefits, how can you participate in this discussion? And for the lucky rest of us, uh, how can we accommodate those who can't? Actually, we had a very big conversation about that throughout the panel and came to the conclusion that investors need to involve more actively those who are on the receiving end of investment practices who might not normally get to be a voice in the room. Um, and how do, you how do you involve them in understanding the consequences of investment earlier? So we did end up in quite a big conversation about how investors and governments and others need to create a more, a different way to have these kinds of conversations where people from all levels of backgrounds, not just elite ones, as you describe, Judy, can participate in these kinds of conversations. And I've probably made it sound more elite by ending talking about cocktails. I was just curious about innovation. Yeah. So sorry I took it off into alcohol. No, no that's, 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 that's very useful. And uh, we had a chap here a couple of years ago, did a talk exclusively on universal basic incomes. And, and it is now a UN priority to look at universal basic incomes. Uh, on the basis that the future value that is going to be created is no longer going to be created by humans. The vast majority of future value is going to be generated by technology and AI. And that opens up a completely different question in terms of how you distribute that value. And I think that's where the UN is now heading. Now, um, we haven't got this specifically on the agenda, but we have got actually a lady from the OECD from the Organization of Economic Development and uh, coming to us week after next. And next week, we have got Christian Chris from Germany giving a talk on political governance and politics. And I think those kind of things will come up. And, 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 and that is, plays also into Judy's comment about, you know, how am I disenfranchised because I'm, I'm, I'm finding it very difficult to make ends meet. And therefore, you know, is this a discussion that really is for the privileged? And I think the, the answer is definitely not. I mean, this is a conversation for all of us. And I think whether that is the way we change our eating habits, whether we are lobbying for change that is much more egalitarian and equally distributed, these are all things that we need to do. Um, so thank you very much for that. Thank you, Victoria, for the answer. Is there any, anybody else in the room wants to ask a question? Then we go to the chat room. It's, it's the same old crowd, as they say. 
Uh, Trevor Hill there. Again. Hello, um, Trevor. I'm actually a member of the Financial Services Club. I saw your presentation recently for them, which is very interesting. Thank you. Um, in your scenario of thinking, uh, I, I, first of all, I would make a quick observation that I think the idea of universal basic ownership is much more interesting than the universal basic income, like because ownership is really important. And I think there's a big question around the nature of money. Yeah. At, was that discussed because basically a lot of the dysfunction is driven by the design of the monetary system. It takes power away from democratically elected politicians. So you have technocrats running the financial system in a certain way. Is that not driving a great deal of the actual dysfunction of the way that investment decisions are being made and so on? You make a really great point. And at this point, I have to say what I'm about to say is not a deep transitions position. It's me speaking as Victoria Ward, who happens to be a co-director of Jigsaw Foresight. Uh, but I, I, what I can say is we spent a lot of time talking about the dysfunction of money and the dysfunction of the investment system. And furthermore, the dysfunction of related systems like accounting and legal and trustees and governance systems, which tend to encourage investors towards short term returns with some ESG and green intentions, but generally um, uh, the whole system is quite dysfunctional. So we did talk about how can you create in the investing system, and perhaps this gets back to the early political point, a real interest in longer term value and returns, which are not necessarily financial, but are also social and about justice and just transition. So how can you recalibrate what you see as return on investment as being social return on investment beyond any of the standards um, that people are being asked to uphold, encouraged to uphold today? And that's actually, if you read the investment philosophy, it goes into that in, in more detail. So we did spend quite a lot of time on that. And then we came to talk about the different worlds we did talk a bit about how money works in those worlds. So in a frugal world, exchange of skills might be as important as monetary exchange in the repair shop, um, you know, for the e-bikes. It might be that there are much more, um, and I do think transition towns are an interesting early model for this, but that there are different kinds of value exchange that serve those causes. The question is then, what does a big investor do to invest in those local systems and also satisfy their trustees and their other beneficiaries. So actually the investors caught in, a, caught in the old world and has a lot of influence that they could choose to exert for the new, but will need to take risks in order to do that. Um, your other question was about universal, uh, rather than universal benefit, it was about universal ownership and in fact we also spend a lot of time on that how can investors of all kinds government and non-government encourage different kinds of ownership system that would lead to say mobility as a service with shared resources rather than personal car ownership at every level of me wanting to do that as a person to the government encouraging that to investors investing in that how could you shift the whole value set towards mobility mobility as a shared service uh, in a way that satisfies everyone who's come from a poor people who have access to transport, but people who are used to quite high end experiences being able to continue to not feel they have to completely sacrifice those experiences in any of these features. Okay, thank you, Victoria. Uh, Michael, you've uh, shown your video. Do you want to ask a question? Um, well, I, I, I'm um, rather. Um, um, uh, taken by the um, by the, the proposition that um, that this is a, a, a scenario which um, uh, uh, by which uh, ideally we would live a sustainable life, but the um, if, if we can afford to do that. And I think that the, the, the point that was raised about um, uh, the have-nots who are trying to make ends meet, and this is not just 
um, in our um, in this country, but I mean internationally, I think that the, the, there are large um, uh, the underdeveloped world, uh, which is probably the majority of humans on this earth. I think they they say it's all very well for you in the developed world to yeah. um, be taking uh, thinking of living along these lines, but you know you've had your uh, you've had the benefits of, uh, of all of the um, uh, growth in, in recent years, and we just want to have a bit of a share of it. And I think that when it comes down to the geopolitics and um, uh, the underdeveloped parts of the world, I think they're going to uh, be taking the attitude that it's all very well to be, us be talking about living like that, but you know, they want to have a slice of the action and um, a, a achieve a certain level of standard of living, you know, before they can start um, uh, thinking along those lines. I think that's, that, that is the big challenge, isn't it? You make a great point, but also some of the most interesting entrepreneurship is coming from uh, those places. I mean, the entrepreneurship around, for example, completely rethinking um, beer is actually was led by uh, African entrepreneurs who then teamed up with U.S. entrepreneurs. So there is also an enormous energy for change in um, places like uh, Africa and Asia that could also be leading the way. And I should just mention at this point that there is a sister project to Deep Transitions called Tipsy, which is transformative something, 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 something. Can't remember what any of the words stand for, but which is actually looking at how do you apply this kind of theory at a policy level? We were particularly what about, looking at China. I, um, did we look at China all that much? Possibly not as much as we should have done. Because, you know, I think that, uh, the attitude of the Chinese is that they want to raise the, um, uh, they, they've raised people out of poverty, but they want to raise their people to a certain standard of living. Yes. And that, that is very destructive of the Earth's um, resources, you know, and climate change and all the rest of it. We can be doing our stuff in the developed world. Yes. Um, but uh, there, it's another way of saying what I've said just now, you know, they, they're at an earlier stage and they want to achieve that level before they start um, worrying too much about um, about uh, about climate change or the sort of things we've been discussing. They want yeah, to, no, you to make a great this. point. There are a lot of complicated pieces in play, aren't there? And I'm afraid yeah, what so I've offered I, you, yeah. I mean, it's, it's the geopolitical yeah. uh, projections over the next um, 20, 30, well, yes. I agree. Period. Yeah. Um, that is going to be the main, uh, the main conflict, I think. I think it is, but I did limit myself to thinking about how people might inhabit societies and do everyday things. And uh, so I chose to limit myself to that, partly because I'm completely not qualified, really, to talk about geopolitics, and partly because I think we do overlook things that are under our noses. For example, what will we miss and how will we make room for that? How will we play? What will the kids do in a metaverse world that's actually a real life thing? So I was keeping myself very much to the human end of this rather than the, the more geopolitical end, mm -hmm. uh, because I know I can talk a little bit about that. Mm -hmm. So I, 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 I feel very tentative about moving into a geopolitical conversation I'm yeah. not really equipped for, Andreas. I'm sorry. No, don't worry, because we already had that from Hamish and from Barrett in the first few talks. And uh, it is very clear that uh, the way developing countries develop is absolutely crucial. And that includes China, includes India, includes African nations like Nigeria. And if that is done in a, in a sustainable way, in terms of uh, technology, not oil powered or coal powered f f stations, reforestation, it really depends on how that happens. And clearly, China uh, has invested heavily in coal previously. It's now trying to get itself off coal. It's probably the biggest reforestation uh, project in the world currently, uh, but there's long ways to go. And I think you know, developing nations uh, cannot, mis cannot repeat the mistakes that the developed world has already made. 
I think that's very clear. Now we haven't got we haven't got anything else in the chat room. I don't think anybody's raising their hand in here. Does anybody want to run the poll? Is there one final question? Uh, this gentleman is 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 itching to say something. So let's make you the last uh, contributor in the room, and then we'll do the poll before we close. Hello, I'm Tom. Okay. That's oh, hello, fine. Tom. Hi, Victoria. I I just thought it was worth quickly opening out the first statement that you made first do no harm because that's a far from simple idea it was i think i think it was taken from the hippocratic oath which yeah to which it's very applicable and it's something that we could all readily agree with but actually doing harm is extremely exciting satisfying to humans and I think we if if we just stay with the with the idea of doing no harm it, it risks being something that is idealistic rather than realistic I think we have to understand that part of our nature that profoundly finds doing harm very attractive and it how deeply it's threaded into the, our whole way of living. I think you make an absolutely brilliant point, which my colleague Wendy Schultz would make too, which is for every desirable future, there are shadow sides and we're, you know, they're, they, they're whole humans. We are whole humans with shadow sides as well as other sides. The idea of the term first do no harm um, really came from a world where we seized the crisis of plummeting biodiversity and degradation of systems and were sort of shaken out of our neglect for the world and its ecosystems. So the idea, the predominant idea there for investors was really that we're resolved to work through rehabilitating nature, biodiversity, uh, a rich ecology on the planet. Uh, and so would then go in a direction of renewable energy, um, reducing energy poverty, going for mobility as a service, uh, changing agriculture quite fundamentally to stop it from being exploitative. Um, but you're absolutely right that it, it, we do love harm. We love to hurt ourselves. Uh, I was talking only this morning about the... Uh, we like the addictive nature of things that do us harm, uh, social media and so on, and sugar and coffee and alcohol. We we are we we are those people who like that. So this everything is held in a very fine balance, isn't it? And so it is also true that in every world there will be breakages of different kinds and darknesses of different kinds, and we need to make room for that rather than just edit it out. That, that is as important in some ways, perhaps, as the inclusiveness that Judy was talking about, of people who are not in the conversation at the moment and should be. Okay, thank you very much indeed, Victoria. We're now just going to do the poll again, as you can see from the shared screen. So if you want to be ready on your phone, if you, have you everybody ready? Good. We'll do the poll one more time and see whether we get a different answer. Human behavior can have the biggest impact on transforming society. That's a good one following the last question. Ninety-ten. <laughs> well, I think we'll leave it there, I think. Uh, Oh, uh, disagrees are coming back, but I think it's very similar to the previous uh, situation. So I think, uh, thank you for that. Is using less a meaningful way forward? Please vote now. Okay. Good. Okay. The answer is obviously more than three quarters say yes, which which I think. We probably knew from the beginning it's not too dissimilar from where we were before and it's creeping up and then finally the world cloud world cloud which is what is the single most important thing humans should consider when it comes to building a new society just put the words that come into your mind uh, there okay oh sex yep 
there's got to be sex everywhere Thank and love. God that was that was usurped by community. <laughs> Good. I do think touch as well. I will just say, I really think we're not thinking enough about the absence, the loss of our other faculties that we sort of noticed a bit in yeah. lockdown, but actually will become more and more relevant as we live in more hybrid worlds. So actually the faculties beyond writing and seeing, I think sensory futures are a very overlooked thing. Yeah. Good. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for that. And I think that Obviously, the word cloud community is the one standout word. Okay, so I think we'll leave it there. Let me just unshare the screen. And I think it forced all of us to thank Victoria very much for an excellent talk tonight. Thank you very much, Victoria. Thank you. Thank you for having me and for great questions. <laughs> Right, just before we go, I'm just going to tell you about the last few talks in the World in 2050 series. Next week, uh, we'll have Christian Chris from Germany giving a talk, and he's going to be like, uh, like Victoria on this big screen here. He's going to give a talk about global political governance, how we will be governed. So are nation states a thing of the past? Are political parties a thing of the past? That kind of thing. So quite, quite a, a taxing question. So that's next week, next Friday. The following Friday, we've got Eliza Lanzi from the OECD giving a talk about global environmental challenges by 2050. And then we go to in technology and innovation, which is done by David Bourne. Again, he will be beaming into the room from Germany. So it's global technology in 2050 and uh, innovation. And then we have a live talk again here on the 4th of August, again a Friday, and that is Professor John Lennox from Oxford University will talk to us about artificial intelligence and the future of humanity. Just some lighthearted thing to finish the series <laughs> off with. So in the meantime, have a lovely time. I hope to see you on Fridays here at the BLSI. In the meantime, have a safe journey home. Good night. Thank you. Victoria, thank you very much indeed. That was excellent. Thank you. Thank you. So I'll be in touch after this, yes? Okay. Take care. Thank you, Andreas. Bye. Thank you, Victoria. Thank you.